afternoon. I'm happy. Yeah, good afternoon. I, I'm happy to have the opportunity to share some things with you in terms of African American history and my own life experience as well. Uh, as previously mentioned, I am a hearing impaired man. I have a uh, 90% loss of hearing. And that might be a shock to a lot of you to see someone with 90% loss of hearing speak as well as I speak, as, as articulate uh, as I am. Um, but I'm one of those people that have become what they call a master lip reader. So I've been a master lip reader since I was a little boy. And so I've learned how to lip read, focus on lip reading for a certain period of time on a certain individual for for a while. And so that has been my journey. But uh, talking today a little bit about African-American history from where I'm sitting in my history perspective, um, I just wanted to start with uh, a little short overview. Uh, because when you start talking about African-American history, it covers a wide range. It's a wide subject. And so there are different pieces and components to it. But let's just take a little overview shot at it, OK? Um, when, when we did go back into the slavery period, African-American history, as we knew it, was not a priority for slave owners during, during that time. So African, the slaves at that time were on the farm, were expected to be uh, field workers, work in the house and so forth. It was brutal labor. It wasn't about sending them to school and let them get an education. That was just far from it for that period of time through slavery. Um, and so along with that was the uh, fact that uh, slave owners were expecting these slaves to produce and reproduce and so forth and enrich their farms, farms get bigger. And in the midst of all of that, education really wasn't a priority where we say, oh, well, we're expecting them to start doing some education. That's not, that's not really moving. And then as we go on, uh, we knew, we know over time in history that slave owners, children, and so forth have been working with slaves children and so forth, teaching them concepts of English and so forth and so on, but wasn't what you would call a formal education. Most of the people during that period of time who may have had a formal education were people who were either in the North or overseas. And so when you look at slavery after slavery was over, uh, people with some people assume that slavery was uh, after it was over that all the slaves all went to school. I've heard that story. I mean, I've been in school for over 30 years. I can tell you what, how, how these things have come down. And so I had to educate kids to let them know that uh, just because slavery was over doesn't mean all the kids went to school. That didn't happen. It just didn't happen. That might have been the expectation, but it didn't happen that way. And so uh, after that period of time, after that period of time, most of the people who we know of that were educated, people were educated in the North. There were some schools that were set up in the South, very school, uh, one room schoolhouse kinds of things or, you know, late night kinds of things in terms of education, but not still not a formal education, but just teaching them some basic English concept names and so forth. Um, so let me move on to where my other train of thought. So many of those people who were educated in the North and overseas like England and Britain at that time became revolutionaries of the movement of underground railroad, those kinds of the things. Um, let's see. Uh, another thing that I saw happening that I read about and I've understood was that some of those same schools that were established in the South as well as in the North also became historical African-American colleges, 
to an historical black college, historical black schools, not all of them, but some of them did. Some of them have progressed that way. Um, so this went on, continue to go on. Um, I just also want to talk about um, Once we, once we got past the slavery, then we end up to the Jim Crow period. And I lived through that Jim Crow period. I was a little boy and I remember clearly where I was supposed to be, where I wasn't supposed to be as a little boy. I remember going to school in the early, in 59 and 1960 and uh, what buildings schools were in, what that building I was going to school in. I also didn't remember too many, uh, what I would call white kids going to the school that I was going to in Virginia. So that became uh, another, another concept. Um, it's just so much to, to cover. Uh, when we go back and look at Plessy, this is Ferguson, and understand that from 1619, all the way to 64, 65, how that lack of African-American students being able to get formal education. That's a significant time period, a very significant time period. People like to say, uh, I've heard people talk about, well, things today should be a little bit more balanced. And I asked the question from 1619 to 1965, do we all of a sudden assume that from 1965 to 2021, everything is, is equal? That can't have, that, that's just not possible. That's a huge gap to overcome in the period of time to play, what you would say, play catch up. But it's just a huge gap. And so I saw that with our period of time. Uh, where we are today, we are today, it's a different atmosphere. We have a lot of what I would call today's problems are much more difficult. They're very broad, complicated, felt with different expectations, political discord, lack of funding, empathy for teachers who are teaching, who are doing a very difficult task. And so I've heard many things over the years. I've watched this uh, as it's grown. Um, we talk about why African-American students are not on this level or not on that level. And then I say to you, you have to sit back and look at first the district. You have to look at the school. You have to look at the funding. You have to look at the migrating factors that surround it. A lot of problems are happening in what you would call inner city, urban, Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit. But what about the little towns and so forth? They seem to be doing better at certain things than others, but it all comes down to what you center your argument on. Is it about reading? Is it about math? Is it about science? Uh, is it about opportunities or lack of opportunities? Is it about funding or lack of funding? Uh, we talked about separated but unequal many years ago. We have moved right back into separated and unequal. We moved right back into it. Okay, and so that's a whole nother dynamics. This is how things are different. So one of the questions I came across, well, some of the questions, we're not doing them at the moment, but I came across was what do we need to do to get African-American students up on this level? And my question is, becomes, what level are you talking about? And what school districts are you working with? Because it's a very, one size doesn't fit all. There can't be a thing where we say one size fits everyone. It, it just doesn't. Uh, most educators would tell you, we deal with kids with a variety of learning styles. So now you're talking differentiated instruction. Some people have no idea what differentiated instruction comes across, but we talk to people in education, outside of education about differentiated instruction. What helps kids learn 
in general? What happens, what helps African-American kids learn in general? I always go back to my own experience um, as a teacher. I taught in, a, uh, in the city. And so I saw it, what I saw in the inner city was different from what I saw in the suburbs. Because when I took a job out in the suburbs, it was like night and day. Because now you're talking about in the, in the suburbs, you talk about homeowners and that kind of thing. When you're talking in the inner city, now you're talking city dwellers, uh, inner city, apartments, all of that. There's just so many migrating factors that people don't pay attention to. We talk about mental health. We talk about uh, free lunch. We talk about lack of K3, K4 programs, and it just piles up. And so it becomes a difference in night and day. So I ask the question, how do we balance that? So all have it. But then I understand there's a political discord we have right now. We're talking about taking books out of school and so forth and so on. So that's affecting education. Even though we may not look at, some people may not look at it that way, but that affects education, okay? Um, lack of funding. That affects education. Why do suburb suburbs have enough money to go out and build brand new schools? But you get into the inner city and you say close down an inner city school, that's a challenge. Because when you close down that inner city school, there's no land across the street to build a brand new school. You have to figure out where you close that school and build a new one or build a new one on that spot the first question you have to ask is, where are those kids going? Where are those kids going? I mean, we, you, these, they're kids in the city. So it's not another school right down the block. So now you're busing the kids. That opens up a whole new can of worms. The people understand about busing, that whole scenario that comes with busing. I sat in a couple of years ago, uh, helping to put a brand new school, not a brand new school, a school in Philadelphia for kids at risk. They wanted to build a school in a warehouse down the street, but the warehouse was across the street, which crosses the county line. I sat in that meeting and watched parents or people in that community yell and scream at each other. And so one of the block captains said, don't insult my kid, my son, and call my son X or Z type of name. But it's just a matter of the building being right across the street. But the people on that side of the street, the way the district county lines were belong to another school district. But we're in the same community. We're, we're in the same community. It's not like the kids will be a bus 20 blocks away. We were talking across the street. And it was just unreal. Oh, well, you're not going to bust those kids over here to my school. So this is the course of where we are right now in education. Even so, for all kids, even with all we talk about African-American kids, when I first read that question, I thought, are we talking primarily about kids in the inner city? Because most of the greatest separation, separation kinds of situations are in the inner city. I taught at a school where most of my kids were free reduced lunch, 70% uh, Hispanic population. Okay, so 70% of Hispanic population, 30, 20, 25% uh, African American population. And so, I mean, I, what I saw there and I understood there, it was like, but then I took a job as a substitute teacher after I walked away from um, being an assistant principal and principal for a while. And I had a chance to go out into the suburbs and see how they were doing. Not so much as the suburbs here in this county, that's all I would say I'm out in Lancaster County. In Lancaster County, we have a lot of different little towns that surround the county. And so, but all of those little towns that surround the county are, I would say a five minute ride down one street or the other. 
but they are different school districts. And you ask the question, why have why are they doing so much better than what's happening in the inner city? When I said to you a few minutes ago about understanding what goes on, the dynamics that go on in the inner city. Well, first of all, if I tell you most of my kids, 90% or 70% Hispanic or 60% Hispanic, now you're looking at a moving population. Okay, uh, this is the Spanish population in this town. We're talking about a moving population, people moving from farms to farms and so forth and so on. I would tell you that the kids I see, the 30 kids I see the first day of school are not the same kids I see on January the 1st. That affects my learning. That affects my test scores on how I get those kids who are there on grade level and beyond because now I'm working with 30 new kids that were not the same 30 kids I saw on September the 1st. And, then, and so I don't want people to say, well, the kids dropped out. No, they didn't drop out. It's a moving population. We call it the kids in transition. When you have that many kids in transition, it affects your test scores. So our test scores are reflecting that when we look at the Pennsylvania test scores and you look at your school district and you see, but no one really care, I want to say cares a lot. No one a little, a little, talks a lot about why that's happening. It's more, you need to get the test scores up. That's the more thing. You need to get test scores up. It's, with transition population is not important. You need to get test scores up. But these are factors that affect student learning. I tell people, don't assume that the kids who come to my school don't want to learn. That's far from the truth. I have kids who are showing up bright and early every morning. But when you're dealing with the transition part, I cannot fix the transition part when I have that many kids leaving school in transition as opposed to failing. Now, if, you want, if they were failing, then you can criticize me and say, well, you know what, the kids are failing. But I'm telling the kids are moving. Kids go back to New York. Kids go back to Puerto Rico. And so I'm saying, how do we develop a program where we keep those kids? But then when you talk about keeping those kids, you then have to talk about helping those families. Why are those families leaving? So it's not enough to say, to do it this way, but you have to go, well, if the parent feels that they can't make enough money to sustain what they're doing here and so forth, so they move to another town or they move to another city or they go back home. So my, my, the, my school is in transition. So these are the things that I've dealt with in the 30 years that I've been in school. I you know, looking at education from 1619 to where we are today, and then looking, listening to people who would talk about, well, what we need to do for kids. And I'm saying, if before you talk about what we need to do for kids, we have to look at that school district, that population. What do you want to measure? What do you hope to achieve? And so what happens here doesn't necessarily mean that works for the school down the street. So if that's my take on all of that. I hope I've given you some insight. I can be a little animated by that. <laughs> but uh, I'm just hoping I gave you some insight from there. Thank you, Roger. Um, yes. Does anyone have any questions they want to type for Roger in the chat? They can even ask them out loud because we have the closed captioning. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions or do you want me to elaborate on some of the questions that you have already, some of the questions that you have submitted? Yeah. That sounds yeah. great. That sounds good. 
Uh, one of the first questions that I had is, was that, how did the experience of being told that you were not college material impact how you uh, communicated with your students about education? I use my um, experience uh, as a teaching tool for all of my kids. Uh, I let them know that despite being told that I couldn't do it, that it was possible. Uh, one of the things I had to instill into a lot of the children that I worked with was uh, motivation and desire doesn't always show up on the SAT or PSSA test. And so that became the driving force for me. Uh, I didn't score very high on the PSA test but I was able to get into college on a, what they call a trial basis. And they were, I had the feeling they were hoping that I flunked out, but I didn't. Uh, one of the things that I had to work with is the fact that back in those days, we had uh, section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1974. Mm -hmm. The problem with the Rehabilitation Act of 504 was that it says that schools and universities must make reasonable accommodations to ensure that all children have equal access to education. <laughs> well, here's the challenge that I went through for all the years that I was in school. What is a reasonable accommodation? What's a reasonable accommodation to you? It may not be a reasonable accommodation for me, but am I handicapped to your reasonable accommodation or do I fight for what I feel is the best reasonable accommodation that's going to help me become successful? So when I first started this, it was, well, uh, we don't have the money to pay for a sign language interpreter or oral, ter uh, or oral interpreter for you so you can lip read them. So we'll give you a walkie talkie, uh, not walkie a tape recorder. Now you think about it. They gave me a tape recorder. I was to take this tape recorder to every class and tape all of my lessons and go back home at the end of the day and listen to this tape recorder. And that was the reasonable accommodation. And then there was an argument that we had, and I love these arguments. I have all the paperwork for, for all of these arguments and so forth that I'm talking about right now to back up what I'm saying. I have all the papers. It was just unreal. So I said, no, that's not working. So then they said, well, another teacher said, well, professor said, well, we have someone in class who's going to take notes for us, take notes for you. And that person is going to take notes for you. And you just take their notes. That's all you need. Well, when I got the notes, if you're the person that's taking notes and you're not going to explain to me what you wrote, I don't know how that note taking works. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that, that was, you know, how that would, you know, this is what we talk about when I say reasonable accommodation. And I'm saying that's not working either. So, I had a professor for science class. Now, the science class in college, you have a pretty much like an auditorium type classroom where the seats go up, mm -hmm. okay? And they understand that the seats go up. You start the first row and the seats go up. All right, the second row is up higher than the third row and so forth. So I get there, it's really like a lecture hall. So I get there and the professor says, well, uh, a reasonable combination for you for this class would be you sit here in front. So right here, the front seat, right in the center, in the middle. And you can see everything that's going on. Well, see, I'm hearing impaired, not visual impaired. <laughs> well, maybe you just didn't have to catch, come, come together, together with that. And so every time you turn your back, how am I reading those lips? And then, and he said, well, are you just, Guess along. He said, I put as much as I can on the board for you. And I said, but I'm still not reading your lips. And he said, well, I try to turn around most of the time. 
But how, if you've been in college class and you've been to see how college professors do their class, you ask yourself how many times when they're writing on the board and how many times are they actually facing you when you're talking? This brand mm -hmm. new class is where the professor talks, sits on the desk and talks to you for the entire hour. But you have classes like science class, uh, math class, philosophy class, where uh, what have you, and the professor has to talk, turn his back, write something down on the board, then my communication is shot. So this is the journey that I've had. Um, it was a frustrating one, but it's bittersweet. Uh, I thrive, but I would say I thrive, but it comes with challenges. This is the things that I share with my kids in my classrooms, that you have to fight through that and keep going. You can't be discouraged because someone says, well, you're not good enough. Uh, you have to be determined to be good enough. So I've been a role model to the kids that I've taught, uh, the inspirational role model for the kids that I've taught. Uh, and that's pretty much how I've made it through. Uh, the next question says, what can be done to improve the education opportunities? Well, that goes back to where, what school you're talking about, what opportunities are, because what works for one school district, that's necessary work for everyone else. Um, one school district I worked with, they were talking to high school, they were talking about uh, providing mentorships for young people. But the mentorships were for all, not just for African-American students, but for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, that's just so many different areas, so many different layers. And so this is where I'm at with it. When I hear that question, I sit back and I say, at what point are you focusing on? And then we talk about how do we help the kids when this is an issue. Funding and lack of resources for all kids is, is, come, is becoming across schools all across the country a major thing, really major thing. Uh, we have uh, politicians who can't find it in their heart to talk about funding K3, K4, because that's too much money. Okay, so how does those kids in that community, K3 and K4 programs, K4, K5, K3, K4 programs become established? It's a very needed thing. And we talk about daycare. Well, we can't agree on, politicians can't agree on how much money to fund daycares. The daycares are, and for the inner city, that is a major function. If we don't have it, what do we do with the, what, what does that parent do with the kids? So it's, um, it, it's complicated. We have a lot of different things to talk about how we go about attacking it. Funding has always been to me a big driving force because when we talk about funding, it's about who have, who have not. And certain school districts have it, wealthy school districts have it. If you are a school district, that surround by shopping malls or factories that have high revenue coming in, then you don't really worry about how much money you get from the state. But if you're a school that depends primarily on the state for X amount of funding and you don't get it or you don't get enough, then it impacts what kind of programs that you can deliver for your district. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, did you have any comments? Look at this in the chat, sir. Uh, Roger, you, you've really oh, made, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, 
I think you really made me think about all the different variables, you know, that we have to think about when we're educating children, particularly in the urban cities. And then you've, you know, you've really made me think about the location, all the forces, the social forces that are bearing in on a school, um, all the things that we have to think about and what are the uh, family um, situations that children come from and how to set kids up for success. And that you really have to use all, all of the resources that you have, not only just what happens in the school, but counseling, family resources, community resources, you know, to help position kids in the best possible light. So I, I'm thinking about things in a new light and I've been in education a long time. So, so thank you. Roger, I'm thinking about kids that we worked with. I was in the mental health system in part of this county and the part of the county I worked in the majority of kids, like 80 to 90% were in two or three different schools in a year. And most of it was economic driven by rents, the cost of apartment rents in this county and people moving from one place to another, from one school to another. And uh, we did a lot of work to try to stabilize the family, but a lot of it was economic and um, that's a much tougher nut, but we often face kids who are in two or three different school districts or different buildings in a year, high transition. And I don't know how much progress we're making on all of that because the economics of it, of housing in this county are huge. And we really witness that every day. Kids just gone the next day we were working with and then we'd have to go find him which we did but it, it's a real challenge that i'm not sure enough thought goes into as you mentioned thank you roger i appreciated uh, your comments about uh, the difficulty of making accommodations for hearing impairment uh, i i learned and third or fourth, probably fourth grade, that uh, I had some vision impairment and I learned it primarily because I naturally gravitated to the first row of the classroom, kind of like you were saying, uh, you'd been directed to do. But what it came across to me more was the idea that uh, behind a good lot of this is uh, something we see throughout our lives in so many other contexts these days, which is the challenge of you know, really nurturing our sense of empathy with others. How does how does a teacher get the sense to realize that uh, uh, a hearing deficiency in a student not something you can accommodate by handing out notes to be read after the fact or tape recordings to listen to at home uh, with presumably the chatter of siblings in the background and mom calling mom or dad calling for dinner and that sort of thing. Uh, how do you ensure that a person with a handicap like that uh, isn't deprived of all the, of the interaction between the other students in the class, the instructor and the students, uh, and all the even sometimes uh, distracting and not necessarily education furthering banter between your, your contemporaries? I mean, part of what we're trying to achieve in school, it seems to me, and certainly one of the stated excuses for busing back in the day was to expose each of us to a variety of folks from other cultures with different backgrounds and different experiences, i.e. empathizing with others who are different from us. Roger, can you talk about some success stories? Uh, I um, I had well, I, I have a few, and uh, it's just far and few in between. Um, one of the things that I did, one of the things that I did, uh, tying up a lot of what's going on here, was I started a program in the school that I was at, the middle school, and uh, that middle school program was called Peaks. It was a program that had originally started in Baltimore and branched out. And so 
uh, we had a few people who went to Baltimore to see this program and then they brought it back to Lancaster. And uh, I, I pretty much was part of the initiation to find out what that program was all about. And so this is a program that is called PEAKS, People Effectively Assisting Kids, P-E-A-K-S, PEAKS. And what this program did was it brought in the police, the community, as well as teachers. We took kids away on a three-day retreat, teaching them self-esteem, team building, teaching them self-esteem, self team building, and leadership skills. And we went away for three days. On these three days, all the participators who were in this program needed to stay with the kids all three days. So we went to places like the army base in the area. We went to the army base, the camps, uh, Boy Scout camps and wherever, what have you. And we all stay. No one goes home. No one. We stay all three days. And we eat with the kids. We sleep with the kids all three days. We have one unit for all the females. We have another unit for all the males. We come together for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you are a participator, the police or the community, you don't get up and go home. No one gets up and go home. You need to make a commitment. You're gonna be there all three days. And uh, it, well, what a joy it was. We, we have so much success stories with that that I had to go and speak before the, the uh, city council. The, the city council in town, I spoke between at the school board, I've spoken at uh, youth, uh, youth, uh, youth rallies and so forth. This is the data. This is the success story. And this is the data. 90% of the kids who were, uh, who were attending, well, I'm gonna say 90%. Well, I can say 90%. We had a 90% attendance. So you're talking about kids from the time they were in the program to the last day of school, 90% attendance. We have kids from the time they were in the program to the last day of school, less than one fraction of suspensions, where we were dealing with about eight a day with that same group of young people we had. We took about 35 kids, 35, 40 kids. And you're looking at, we were looking at their uh, discipline record. We were averaging eight or more suspensions for that group of, for that group of kids. A week, we went down to less than one. The attendance we were looking at kids were being absent at least two days out of the week. We went down to 90%. That's a, that's a huge comment. We had kids who were one grade below grade level. We raised those kids up to a grade level, one grade level above where they were when they first started the program. So the school board loved it. They liked what we were doing. The downfall of this is money. It cost us about $4,000 to take those kids on three days, not to mention the fact that we took about five or six staff members, teachers out of the building. The good part about the police was they loved it. They, could, they were fighting themselves to be the ones to come. <laughs> and then the last part was the community was not a problem. We always have people in the community who wanted to go. What made that program so successful is the kids who were in it, as well as the people who were part of my team. What I said to my team from the very beginning, we need to be committed. This is hard work. You're talking about kids who opened up to us about things over three days that they would have never opened up to anyone else about. 
We've had to call the police at least two or three times in 15 years because kids were being abused. You have a girl that's being sexually abused at home. She's not going to come to school and tell her teacher, guess what? I'm being sexually abused at home. But she told us at the retreat. And we have the obligation to help her. We couldn't say, oh, you poor thing. No, we have an obligation to help her. So we had to call the police, which we did. We had to get crisis intervention involved, which we did. We had to get children and youth involved, which we did. Um, we're not sorry we did it. We had no choice, but we did it because this is our commitment to the kids. Another successful story, and I won't bore you with all the successful stories because I have a lot of them. We have a teacher who took a kid whose mother, whose mother died. The kid was from Honduras. Mom died at work. Mom came to America because the father was abusing them. So mom came to America. She didn't want any. So mom dies. So who takes care of the boy? That 14 year old boy was smart enough to go sleep with all of his different buddies who gave him a place to stay. He would go to his buddy's house and say, my mom's out of town, I don't have any place to stay. The parent of that kid would say, oh, you can stay with us until tomorrow. And then he finds another buddy, repeats the cycle. And then he finds another buddy, repeats the cycle. How do we find out about it? Because a parent called us, came to school and said, I'm concerned about that kid because I know his mother is from Honduras and I haven't seen her for a while, but he's been spending the night over my house and I'm really concerned about where his mother is or whether his mother abandoned him. So now we got to go back again. Got to call the police, got to call children and youth. Yeah, that they open this, the whole scenario starts again. But the kids he would stand with were kids in our peak program. And they looked out for him. That was an amazing thing. They looked out for him. But this story doesn't stop there. It just keeps going on. So I have a homeschool visitor who went out to find out what that kid, what was going on. She finds out his mother died. They didn't have anyone to contact. They had no idea she had a child. So children and youth has them. But children and youth only had them for a couple hours. I have a teacher who was in our program said, I will take that kid until children and youth find out still where they can have him be. I will take care of him, make sure he comes to school every day. She had two children of her own. So she was vetted, all of that, and children and youth said try. She didn't want any money from children and youth or anything like that. She was going to take care of that little kid because she had a daughter that was 13 and the boy was 14. She had a daughter that was 13, another one that was 11 or 12. So he stayed with that family. And you ask me how long did he stay with that family? I would tell you, we had him in October, October, late October, early November. He stayed with that teacher till the first week of May. The children and youth found an uncle, an aunt actually, that lived in Honduras, who flew in from Honduras to cut to get him. And he had a choice. And he sat there with tears, from what I understood, he sat there with tears in his eyes. He really, really didn't want to leave, but there was family. And he liked that aunt. That aunt was one of his favorite aunts. So he made the decision to go with his aunt back to Honduras. Do so you understand what I'm saying when I say success stories like that? See, no one pays that teacher to do that. No one pays her. No one made her do it. No one asked her to do it. She said, this is the kid I stayed with, that I worked with when I was at the retreat. And because I worked with this kid when we were at the retreat and he was part of my group, I'm keeping him if I can. And that's where, 
And, you know, we had people at school who wanted to give her clothes and stuff, but she just kept saying, no, 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 I don't want it, no. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but um, it's a good story. It's a good success story. And uh, I'm happy uh, to see that. This is what I've done. This was my contribution. I love the program. Uh, we couldn't afford it. And that's the sad part because academics what became the theme more than the child's overall being. My thing has always been since I've been a teacher has been, it's not enough to do academics. You need to embrace the whole child. You need to embrace the whole child. I've had people who try to tell me that, well, the kids is doing bad in school because mom and dad got a divorce. And so since mom and dad got a divorce, he or she has been doing bad in school and the kids should get over it. And my thought back on that is, how dare you tell me that the kids should get over it? I know grown people that don't get over it. How about that? Let's try that with science. I know grown people that don't get over it. And I know grown people that would say, I haven't talked to my ex in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I don't even want to see them. But yet you're telling that 12 year old boy to get over it. I mean, that's, you know, I have, um, I have, that's where I sort of draw the line where my passion for the kids is all, is all about. Embrace the whole child. If kids are doing bad in school, did you have to ask, why? Why? Okay, if we don't ask why, don't find out why, then you sort of code over it. So that's why I have there. I have some questions here. Um, favorite book from Jane. Um, it's a, uh, for, I have so many. It's a matter of what subject and topics you want to talk about. Um, I read, uh, I read books, a lot of different books over the years. When I was in college, I have a book that you will probably like. It's probably outdated now, but I had a book in college and I heard the professor talk and it was one of the best talks that I ever heard the professor say. The professors, the uh, lecture, person that was giving the lecture said, if the title of his book was called I ain't much baby, but I'm all I've got. Think about that. I ain't much baby, but I'm all I've got. And it's a book by Jesse Lair. And if you look up Jesse Lair, he has a number of books. That was really a dynamic book. One of the other books that I've read that sort of hit home was a book that talked about when bad things happen to good people. Mm. That's a tough book. When bad things happen to good people. And then so you know, I've read books. I have different books, different subjects and so forth. You know, I just tab them. Some of the, I have some Maya Angelos and do it. I have, to, and so it just depends on the mood I'm in when I see a book and I go pick it up and so forth and so on. I have some books on social uh, social justice and so forth like that. Uh, the, the names the names are endless. Did anyone ever ask you why the combinations would be helpful you to you? Yeah, they asked me to get what I wanted. And I told them that uh, what would be the oral interpreter, but paying that interpreter is expensive. You understand I'm taking 18 credits. You're paying that interpreter by the hour. When you start adding that up five days a week, I would say somebody needs to have some money in the budget. And the first thing they said, well, no. But here's the, here's the kick to that, that I raise people's social awareness on. If I needed a wheelchair, would you have denied me? You see, this is where the issue is. If I needed a wheelchair, would you have denied me? 
Because then you would say, oh, well, we need to tear down the steps or do this, or build a ramp, and boom, boom, boom. But because I say I need an oral interpreter, well, you know, you're paying her $25, $30 an hour. Well, we can't afford that. So we'll do the next best thing. We'll give you a tape recorder. So, you know, if I mean, if this is the challenge that you do. Um, um, and I've dealt with that. Um, with my human laws. And it's one of the things that has opened my eyes in many ways to the fact that uh, people who are hearing impaired would not take the journey that I've been on because these are all the obstacles and roadblocks that are in the way. No one really wants to be where they're not wanted. So you're talking about fighting through where you're not wanted, regardless and continue to do it. And so I've had success with it over the years. That's why I said it's been bittersweet. There are some good things and then there's some not so good things, but I've learned to continue on. Um, and speaking of books, I wrote a book. If you want to take the opportunity to uh, look it up online and read it, my book is called Tis Grace Shall Lead Me On. That's the name of the book. Could Tis you repeat this? What? Tis grace. Yes. Tis grace shall lead me on. Thanks. Um, it says, how do you feel the better way to handle kids that are in transition to get their scores up? Um, is that something that needs to be addressed outside or instead of inside the school? It's a combination of both. It's a combination of both. When you're talking about, because what I said before is that if the kids is in transition, why are parents leaving? Why are your parents pulling kid out of school in the middle of the year? You know, and it's about whether they have enough money, whether they need to move to another area, whether they're dealing with personal crisis within the home. Okay, that's another issue, dealing with personal crisis within the home. I have had kids whose father or mother was in jail. What are we going to do about that? How do, who helps that kid when that happens? That affects that kid's learning. That affects that kid's mental health. Uh, I've had at least two different counseling services that were attached to our school, not the district, our school period. The problem with having both of those counselors attached to our school, psychologists is what I would say, is that you have to pay the psychologists. We have to pay the psychologists. And so that's only so much we can give that psychologists to do with the number, with the limited amount of funding that we have. And so if I have 15 kids that need to see the psychologist and the psychologist can only see three of them, four of them tops, twice a week. And you're, you're playing musical chairs with which one you can get the best service for. And then you have to hope if you can, that the parents have some kind of insurance to take care, to help offset that. But if the parents don't have insurance, if you have parents who are, if kids are on free and reduced lunch, then you're also gonna have kids whose parents are not gonna have that insurance as well. I've had kids who haven't seen a dentist in years. Kids who haven't seen a doctor in years. And then in Lancaster City, we have a quite large homeless population. And all those kids come to school. So these are, these are, so when I say things are different now, and these are the challenges, these are the challenges. They add up, teachers do an, an incredible job with very little and a little empathy to go along with it. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm more than happy to share with you. Well, 
one, one thing I've noticed throughout your presentation is that it seems like a lot of these problems are caused by a lack of willingness to invest in these children. Would you say that that's accurate? It is. We spend more money on so many different things, but we don't want to spend a lot of money on, on teaching. We don't really want to spend a lot of money on daycare. Daycare centers are unbelievable, how much money they charge. I don't think some people even understand, really realize that until you really, really need daycare. <laughs> and you can't pay for it. So I have kids who don't come to school. And I said to the kid who was 12 years old, why were you not in school? And she said, two days a week, I have to stay home and take care of my brother while my mother goes to work. There's your learning. So we want to know why she's not doing well academically. There's your answer. There's your answer. Don't let people get spoon feed us about kids don't want to work or they're lazy and all of that. Yeah, you can get a little bit of that, but I wouldn't say that's overall. It's not overall. Uh, what we always, my mother used to say, if you want to know uh, what someone is like, you know, take a walk in their shoes. I taught in the inner city. Uh, in Lancaster, Philadelphia. I've had an opportunity to go with my home school visitor to different houses, different homes. Some of the stuff I saw just hurt my stomach. I have people living in backyards in a tent with no bathroom, extension cord coming down the rock, extended from the house to the tent to provide a heater and so forth. And I thought to myself, how, how can they live like this? Kids come to school. Kids were coming to school. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many how many times I bought clothes for kids. I've I, I've told my cafeteria stuff. I don't care how much money it costs me, but we're not going to send any kid out of my lunch room without lunch. That's that where people in who live here in this city who knew me when I was at the school knew that was Mr. Walker's philosophy. You're not sending a kid out of my out of my lunchroom without lunch. So if I have to pay for it, so what? I pay for it. And I can tell you, I paid as much as $25, $30 every week or every other. It, I didn't focus on how much I had to pay. I focused on that kid needs to eat. My kids need to eat. That's my passion. That's my mission. That's who I am. That's what I'm about. My kids need to eat. So I told my home, I told my cafeteria aid, feed my children. We know who doesn't have money. So now let's not think that, oh, we get taken advantage of. We know who has money. The kids know. The kids, middle school kids are not ashamed or embarrassed. But, you know, mostly the middle school kid who doesn't have money go over there and sit in the corner and won't eat, he or she, because they are too ashamed of ours to say I don't have any money. So I tell that, I tell the homeschool visitor and I told the um, these cafeteria staff, send that kid to my office after lunch. And I told that kid, I expect to see you. Take this little card that I gave them and go get lunch every single day. These are the little things. These are what kids come to school with. <laughs> Any other questions? No. We can continue. You, you touched a couple of times, Roger, on the subject of test scores and having to teach to standardize test targets for a particular school or a school system. Uh, it's, it's interested me, it's been interesting to me to watch the last few years where we've gone from a system where admission to college was highly dependent on things like SAT scores. You know, 
you could have all kinds of other problems, but as long as you got those good SAT scores, your chances were pretty good. And conversely, if you didn't test well and the SAT drove you nuts, nah, didn't matter how good an athlete you were or who your parents were, you were going to have trouble getting into a good college. Well, now I'll be darned. The uh, Many of the colleges have dropped the SAT as a requirement or they're downplaying the importance of the SAT scores in their admission process. Um, but I wonder what your thoughts are on use of somewhat similar standardized test metrics as a mechanism for evaluating teacher success, uh, often without much of anything in the way of a sense for the people being subjected to that testing, kids and parents both, as to just how darn accurate those numbers are in terms of tracking human potential. I mean, dude, that's absolutely, well, we, we are a test nation. Uh, we test everything. We want to test kids in school. We, teachers need to pass the test score and so forth and so on. Um, but I keep saying this over and over again is that you really can't measure desire, motivation, and desire. You really can't measure that. And so what you lose when you depend too much on the test score is that part of motivation and desire. And so, um, but this is where we are as a nation. It's, it's a very unfortunate part of what we do. Uh, we depend on test scores and how we compare our tests with other countries and so forth and so on. And that becomes the... One of my teachers talked about this a couple of years, many years ago, and she said what frustrated her was we were teaching kids to test rather than teaching kids to learn. And we were supposed to be teaching kids to learn. We were teaching them to test. So they need to learn A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. But what got lost in that was uh, I attended a seminar a couple of many years ago, and it was a math seminar. And the guide said, well, we're teaching these kids to test, but you're not teaching them to learn. He said, now see, here's an example of teaching, of testing and learning. You give kids the answer sheet and you tell them to pick one, A, B, C, D. They look at the math problem and then they figure out what the answer is. But do long division, math, long division, 35 into 571. Do long division, paper and pencil. You need to know how to carry, how to add, multiply, carry, bring it down till you get to zero. <laughs> You just can't look at the top and say, well, I know the answer is about five, maybe six. No, you need to show your work. That's what we're talking about. Show your work. You have that math problem. Here it is. Show your work. What the guy that was in charge of the math uh, foundation, he's the national math, uh, president of the national math and science mm -hmm. part. And he talked about, at that time, uh, 40% of eighth graders could do long division math. That was an eye opener for a lot of people. And he said, you're teaching the kids how to take the calculator and do it. But there's no calculator. He had a pencil, a piece of paper. There's the math problem. You do the long division all the way down the paper. <laughs> and so, you know, this is where we are. Teachers are frustrated with that. Teach to, teach to the test. And I've heard that a lot all the way up until I retired uh, a couple of years ago. The teachers were frustrated with teaching kids, teaching kids uh, to test, but not teaching kids to actually learn. Roger, I'd like to thank you for speaking with us today and also for continuing your work past your retirement. That's, that's great because you know so much and have thank the you. passion.
Thank and you, Roger. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Yes. Appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. you so much. You've really enlightened us. <laughs> and encouraged and motivated mm -hmm. us too. Right. Absolutely. <laughs>